afternoon and welcome to Together for the Future of Europe. I'm Brian McGuire. I'll be moderating the session this afternoon. This is part of a new series of webinars with the European Parliament's former members association. A very warm welcome to all the former MEPs who have joined us today and a special welcome to the members of the public. We really appreciate your participation and your questions later on uh, today also. So thanks for taking the time. We have a prestigious panel of speakers lined up today. Uh, Hans Goethe Puttering, uh, FMA President and European Parliament former President from 2007-2009. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Good afternoon, uh, Brian. So, Mithlas uh, Zorinda, uh, he is President of the Wilfred Martin Centre for European Studies. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez, uh, President of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies. Great to see you again, Maria Joao. And uh, Jürgen Martins, uh, President of the European Liberal Forum, joining us uh, from Berlin this afternoon. Jürgen, good to see you. And uh, also Suzanne Riga, she's the co-president of the European Green Foundation. And uh, she's joining us normally from Barcelona, but from uh, Bonn today. And uh, shortly we'll also be joined uh, by Renard uh, de Rousse. He's the mm -hmm. president of the European University Institute. Uh, some, uh, just some notes this afternoon before we get started. This webinar launches a new long-term cooperation between the FMA, European Political Foundations, and the European University Institute. And the series will see initiatives examining the short and long-term implications of the COVID crisis for the European project and encouraging an open debate on the key challenges in which we now face. The aim is to open up the debate, uh, deepening discussion on the various guiding themes uh, in the following sessions. And before we begin, special thanks to the European Parliamentary Research Service, which has selected some of its resources to provide participants with uh, background information and insights linked to the guiding themes of this event, which you'll have seen uh, on the website uh, page as well. The link will be available to uh, to all on our website and on the Facebook page uh, of the event. And finally, you're all invited to continue submitting uh, questions and comments and messages on our Twitter and Facebook uh, accounts. The former MEPs can use the Zoom platform uh, Q&A, which you'll find on the bottom uh, right-hand side of your screen. Uh, while members of the public can post comments on the Facebook Live page, our team will collect those and uh, we'll put those uh, to our panelists later on. So please add your name if you can. So. Uh, we can see uh, where uh, our audience is today and uh, organization if that, that's suitable for you today. The format uh, you will see from uh, our agenda. Uh, we'll kick off with uh, short uh, statements, uh, opening remarks from each of our panelists. Um, I'm asking them for three minutes. We'll have a little bit of tolerance uh, for that. At uh, maximum four minutes, I'll ask them uh, to wrap up. And then about uh, 3.30, uh, Renaud de Hus will uh, join us for a keynote speech this afternoon and uh, some remarks, which will be until about 5.45. We'll start the debate with our panelists, and uh, from about 20 past four, we'll do Q&A with you, our audience, as well. But please send the questions in at any point, and if you want them addressed to a specific person, please put that person's name uh, in the, the question or comment, if you just want to make a comment, and we'll uh, put those uh, to our panelists later. Now it's my pleasure to give the floor to hans uh, Puzuri, and uh, the floor is all yours, sir. Thank you very much, Brian McGuire. I want to thank you as moderator that you are available today and allow me as chairman of the former members association to thank uh, the other participants as well. Uh, Mikola Shurinda, the former prime minister of Slovakia, then uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez, we were colleagues in the European Parliament, then uh, Jürgen Martens, uh, a friend from the Liberals. I hope you are not offended when I say that. This and Susanna Riga for the Greens, with whom I have a good relation as well. And I want to thank uh, Renaud de Hus when he joins us uh, to make uh, his speech. And especially I want to thank uh, the director of the former members association, Elisabeth Fonk, and her team. Here are two other ladies, and uh, so they are working very effectively. And if you allow me, Brian, now the time after thanking all of you, <laughs> now the time might uh, start to count. So I would like, if you allow me, to reverse a little bit uh, the, uh, the points and start with democracy. I think it's very important that we always know democracy, majority in a democracy is very important, but it's very decisive on which basis uh, democracy works. And for me, it's the most important, uh, important that we in the European Union and in our member states know that our community, the European Union, our member states are based on values. And these values are the dignity of the human being, liberty, democracy, 
legal order, what is very, very important, and uh, peace. And hopefully we are always united on the basis of solidarity and subsidiarity. As far as the economy is concerned, I think we should remember that in the Treaty of Lisbon, which so to say is our constitution, we have an article speaking about competitive social market economy. And if we accept this principle, I think all other uh, answers uh, come out of this uh, principle. As far as Green Deal is concerned, uh, if you allow me to say it personally, I had the honor to sign the first Green Deal uh, in the European Parliament uh, with the then uh, Deputy uh, uh, Prime Minister of Slovakia, Necha, uh, the uh, 23rd of April 2009, with the uh, with the reductions of CO2, 20%, renewals, 20%, and everything should be achieved until 2020. And so the European Union took the lead in fighting climate change. And I think we should better make it known in the world that the European Union is very ambitious concerning that. As far as digital Europe is concerned, uh, I, in my age, I'm certainly not so familiar with it, but uh, thanks God I have good uh, people helping me. But I think digital, uh, digital Europe is very important to be competitive with our partners uh, in the world, uh, whether it be the United States or China or whosoever. But at the same time, and this is my message, we should never forget the human aspect uh, of the digital world and trust and confidence can only be built up when people meet in person. And I think this is very important and history in this framework is very important because everything can happen again in a different way. What has happened in a tragic way on our European continent. My last point to be more or less in the uh, frame you gave us as far as timing is concerned. I think the European Union has to become stronger uh, as, as far as uh, foreign affairs, security and defense uh, is concerned. The Americans are not, not, so, not too strong. We as Europeans are too weak. And with the challenges we have with the um, present president of um, America, I think we should take this as a lesson to make us, the Europeans, stronger. And as far uh, as uh, China is concerned, I think China is a great threat for us because they try to control their citizens in China by 100%. We see what is happening in Hong Kong, and I think we have to do everything uh, that we are not too dependent on uh, China, that we are ready for dialogue, but at the same time resist all temptations uh, that China wants to dominate uh, the world. And my last point is we have to look to Africa. We have to find a solution as far migration is concerned. This is not only a political question, it's a question of uh, deep human thinking as well. And I think we should be united to find solutions for these poor people who try to come to Europe. They cannot all come to us, but we should have a position of openness and those who are, uh, who are oppressed by their governments should get our help. So. Uh, I hope I remained more or less uh, in the framework of four minutes. Thank you. You're, you're right on the money. <laughs> Thank you for that. A really great uh, broad uh, spectrum approach to, to what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, some uh, uh, clear themes uh, mapped out for us already. Thank you so much, Hans Gerd. Uh, our next uh, speaker today, uh, Nicholas Zurinda. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Brian. First of all, I'd like to thank the former members uh, association at the helm with President and fantastic friend of mine, Hans Gerd, for bringing us together. The second, I'd like to greet all my colleagues from the other European <coughs> I have three minutes. It means I raise three issues. The first is pandemic, of course. Uh, pandemic has caused a lot of difficulties uh, and inconveniences. The remedy of our economy will be very difficult and very cost. But I see also certain positive uh, uh, and significant side effects of, of this challenge. The first is our recognition that the EU has to rely, first of all, on itself. That we need to decrease our dependency on China, as uh, Hans Gerd recently um, mentioned. 
I mean on about uh, pharmaceutical industry, for instance, but also about our dependency uh, when it comes to technology, 5G network and so on. The second, I have a feeling that we understand better now how to shape Europe, the EU in the years to come. The lesson learned by my mind reads, we need to act locally, also with, in such complex and global issue uh, like pandemic is, but at the, sa at the same time, we need a higher performance at the communitarian level. For instance, when it comes to securing our freedoms or the Schengen regime inside the EU. So it was the point number one. The second, the summertime has also unveiled that every dictatorship has its limits and no a pleasant or a perspective way out. I mean the situation in Belarus. I mean the case of Navalny, the Russian opposition leader. I am speaking about the situation in Hong Kong, but also in Taiwan. And last but not least, about the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. We know about the clash between Greece and Cyprus on one side, Turkey on the other side. It brings a very strong message to all autocrats. And I have to admit that also inside the EU, pluralism, checks and balances, or liberal democracy principles are much perspective than any robust policy or uh, autocracy, not speaking about dictatorship. And I have a feeling that all politicians, all leaders should realize this. And last point is, uh, what about tangible, immediate or actual challenges? I see four of them, not speaking about very, very long term issues like digital or Green Deal, but very tangible in my eyes is to promote new jobs, not only due to, due to pandemic, but also due to uh, artificial intelligence, digitalization or, or technological uh, advances as, as such. The second, uh, we have to prepare ourselves, not only on massive and meaningful spending in coming years, but also sooner or later on fiscal consolidation. We should realize that we need not only to spend money, but surely uh, 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 sooner or later to repay this, this amount of money. Uh, we can speak about such sensitive issue as new potential, new independent or own, own EU resources. Number three is the question how to strengthen our adherence to rule of law and liberal democracy principles, especially, I have to admit, in our part of the world in Central Europe. And last, not, uh, last but not least, we need to shape our European House on the strict implementation of subsidiarity principle. Very concretely, we need to promote the reform of the Eurozone. We need to change the decision making uh, in the area of foreign policy, to be able not only to speak with one voice, but also to act. And last but not least, we need to build and develop our common European Defense Union. For the moment, this is it. Thank you. Thank you. Right into the bar. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, Maria Joao, your turn, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, and uh, my greetings to uh, President Hans Pottering and uh, all our friends uh, participating in this debate throughout Europe. And of course, uh, to also my colleagues uh, chairing uh, the European Political Foundations. This is our first time together like that. And I think this is a very interesting contribution for European democratic uh, debate. So, our assumption is that Europe is now going to some defining moments. Uh, the first big issue is how can we deal and should we deal with the pandemics, with the corona health, social and economic crisis? Are we supposed just to be reactive or should we really be proactive with a strong European recovery plan uh, pushing for the priorities of green transition, 
with social fairness, creating new jobs, protecting the existing viable jobs and companies. And we know that uh, uh, in order for this plan to fly, we need to have the financial resources for these and we need uh, to back them with new own resources based on new kinds of taxation, the digital, the pollution. Mm -hmm. the this is a big test, I believe. Then we have a second one on the international front. Because right now, Europe is dealing with a kind of new world, with this uh, systemic competition between the uh, United States and China. We see this in different uh, areas. And we need to say that we Europeans, we should come with our own positions, aligned with our preferences, our values. And a good example is about uh, what is uh, going on now in the digital field. Uh, I do believe uh, that there is a European way to drive the digital revolution, different from the American one, which is a market-led uh, one, and different from the Chinese one, which is a state-led uh, driven digital revolution. From my viewpoint, uh, Europeans should make the best of this digital transformation, but focusing on social needs, on the green transition, making sure that people working on online platforms, they count on basic social rights, and also protecting our personal data. So this shows how different can be the European way of driving the digital uh, revolution. So these are some uh, key challenges, key defining moments. And I believe that uh, to have a kind of a European consensus different from the American one, the Washington consensus or the Beijing consensus uh, would be something interesting for us to work together. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mary Joao. I think we're going to be speaking a little bit digital uh, today as well. And uh, you're the, the closest to the target time today so far. Uh, mm -hmm. We have uh, Renaud uh, de Hoos is joining us uh, very shortly. Uh, our next speaker now is uh, Jürgen Martins. Uh, Jürgen, the uh, floor is yours, sir. So, I, I hope you can hear me. Clearly. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to discuss the, the future of Europe this afternoon together with you. And uh, yes, I said uh, some, sometimes before, I said, uh, as liberal, you have to be optimist. Otherwise, you are not liberal. And... Um, we are in need of optimism these days. I think uh, we rely on the same values as democracy, human rights, the rule of law and the independence of justice, for instance, and we rely on market societies and free media. And all these, um, all these points are challenged today from inside, from right-wing populists, but even from, the, from ourselves. When I look back into the beginning of lockdown in March and April, we fall back into a certain selfishness of nations, in closing simply our frontiers in, uh, yes, in keeping medicinal stuff within our borders, not allowing to be exported to other countries. It was a shame uh, to see this. And uh, for that, we have to discuss uh, very clear and very seriously uh, what is, uh, what's, what's about the, the future within the European Union. We are challenged from inside and we are challenged from outside. And um, you mentioned already the, the challenges, challenges arising from, from the Middle East, from North of Africa, from the migration, migration, migration crisis, for instance. But there are much more and severe things coming ahead. I'm talking about uh, Belarus. And um, I talked these days to experts and, and Russians and Russian experts. And all of them told me that there's only 
one solution from the Putin angle to see for Belarus. Belarus will be ruled or be taken by Russia. There's no other um, way. There's no plan B. The only plan B on long term for the, not for the Russians, for Putin, is uh, to take over in Belarus. And if I look back into the beginning of this year and the corona crisis and how we behaved then, uh, I'm a little bit skeptic whether we can find a common position and a strong and common answer to the challenges that we need, uh, that challenges coming ahead, I think, within even one year or sooner. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, our last panelist. Thank you, Jorgen. This is uh, a, a very clear position where we need to go with our foreign policy now as well. Uh, Suzanne, we have uh, three, four minutes for you, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to assume what you have uh, already said. I would like to thank the organization to have uh, this possibility to meet together this uh, this afternoon and also my colleagues from the other political foundation i think it's a good initiative and uh, i share what you uh, said uh, 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 mrs pertering to say that we have a lot of values in common uh, and i think we have to work on this because it's a, it's a challenging time we all know this so thanks for this and i hope we can uh, even really follow up with uh, some issues in the future so uh, I think uh, what you said already, it's clear we have uh, multiple crises on different issues uh, uh, and be, uh, well, we always say we are challenged, challenged and situations are getting uh, complicated, but yes, we are really facing a complicated time. So what we have to put on and what we are, where we also as political foundation can, can help or can do something is to up resilient societies and to build up really an economy um, and a social system where it's possible uh, to survive situations like this. So I think we have really clearer to about concrete examples like circular economy, uh, relocalization re um, to, to offer a more sustainable uh, uh, globalization and to bring in a fair globalization. So uh, I think we have a lot of answers already and we have to put them into practice. Um, when we talk about the social and health policies, I think we have to talk about, about something like uh, uh, the uh, universal basic income or how to organize this in the future. Um, uh, so there will be a lot of uh, points where we uh, can arise the dialogue, uh, not only on the institutional level, parliament and in the European institutions, also to new forms of dialogue with the civil society and uh, this brings us further to to decide together in the future of Europe because we need to get the people on uh, the board. And I think uh, when we talk about the Green Deal and uh, that's, that's Green uh, European Foundation, Green Deal, uh, it's a really important issue and uh, the green transformation. And at the same time, we have to look for uh, that we uh, bring this financially, but also on the organizational level together with this uh, recovery funds now. So we have an actual a crisis, we have to face this, but we have to, f uh, to face a long-term crisis on the economic level. And uh, there we have to go in the same, both of these, and to look for what is the best way to find it. Um, and I, I also would like to, to put on uh, that what we, what we said, I said before on the sustainable international trade and uh, fair globalization to define this and to look for where can things in common and where we can, can work together on this. Um, what we need is transparency and uh, to include uh, citizenships. We, uh, we, you have said a lot about the dig digitalization. I think this will be our future and our present at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, we need also direct contacts and uh, direct networks. And there we will have to, to work together. We as foundation, we are working in points of like the post Corona talks, we try to find and to bring this economic and uh, social issues together. So this is something I think we, we that there are practice uh, uh, on this. And last sentence, um, I think what we need is also more transnational projects and transnational 
intercultural communication to learn from each other. So our next uh, speaker uh, for the keynote this afternoon is Renat de Hus. He is uh, president of the uh, European University Institute. Uh, previously, he was Jean Monnet Professor of European Law and Political Science at Science Po, where he founded and directed the Center for European Studies. He also chaired Science Po's Governing Council. And before moving to Science Po, he held professorships at the EUI and at the University of Pisa. And he's also a scientific advisor Europe, the Center for Research Fund by Jacques Delors. Uh, lovely to have you on this afternoon. Um, you have about 15 minutes, I think. We'll be a little tolerant this afternoon. We're on good form. Um, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first, for your invitation uh, and also for your patience since I couldn't be available right away for the start of this event. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to uh, work with a former members association. Uh, uh, with which uh, we've had now for a number of years uh, a very dense uh, partnership. And, and I think, of course, uh, there is much to be discussed in the, in the present uh, period. Um, for the sake of discussion, I, I will try to focus my remarks on essentially three points that are uh, related to the discussion. First, uh, what we learned uh, during uh, recent month uh, concerning the, um, the capacity of the EU to respond to the COVID crisis. Second, uh, uh, the complex relationship between uh, uh, the handling of the COVID uh, challenge and uh, democracy. Uh, and third, uh, I will conclude with uh, a few remarks on uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe uh, and the kind of debate uh, I think we need. Um, but first, let me return to the COVID crisis, which uh, it has been, of course, a game changer uh, in so many areas uh, uh, for the Union as well as for its member states. And here, um, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, there are already a number of things uh, that can be learned from uh, the comparison between the European response to the COVID crisis on the one hand and uh, its response 10 years ago to uh, the previous economic and financial crisis because uh, really uh, there, are, uh, there are a number of striking differences. Uh, it seems a long time ago, but you will certainly remember that uh, in um, 2008, 2012, in the period, uh, the most acute period of uh, uh, the economic and financial crisis, uh, we uh, had great difficulties to uh, orchestrate uh, a European response. Uh, you will certainly remember that a number of heads of state and government at the time said that uh, this was uh, the hour of nation states to use the language of then president Nicolas Sarkozy and uh, because the political crisis was acute it was for uh, national governments to to take a leading role uh, and so they did to a large extent to the detriment of uh, supranational institutions in uh, in the first instance we uh, also witnessed in that occasion a strong emphasis on one point, the necessity to uh, restore sound public finances. But uh, uh, beyond than that, uh, the uh, European Union found it very difficult to articulate uh, a large scale uh, response to uh, the crisis until basically uh, Mario Draghi's uh, famous uh, whatever it takes uh, speech uh, of September uh, 2012. I recall those uh, element simply to uh, illustrate the point I wish to make, which is that uh, in uh, uh, the recent month, the, the Union has demonstrated a, a far greater capacity uh, to act uh, together in a cohesive manner. Think that uh, uh, the, the pandemic was only starting, we were uh, in March, uh, when uh, the ECB announced its uh, massive program of purchase of government and uh, corporate bonds just weeks after uh, uh, 
the beginning of uh, the lockdown uh, in Italy, the first country, first European country to be hit. A couple of days, not weeks, later, the Commission followed with uh, the proposal to suspend the Stability Pact uh, for uh, uh, some time to, uh, I quote, uh, uh, ensure that uh, cohesion within the Union is maintained through solidarity and responsibility. And I quote that language because it's important. The word solidarity uh, uh, is a word that we didn't hear uh, all that frequently in the first years of the previous uh, crisis. And as you know, uh, that idea of a recovery plan was later picked up by uh, the, the German and the French government in a joint proposal and ultimately uh, approved by uh, the uh, European Council after four days of rather intense uh, bickering in July. Uh, now, you might say what changed at the end of the day, the big decision was uh, taken uh, by uh, uh, representatives of uh, states and, and governments uh, agreeing uh, unanimously. Yes, that's true. But at the same time, if you look at the substance uh, and not only at the procedure, you will see that the proposal was largely uh, uh, informed by uh, successive uh, ideas put forward by uh, the Commission. That even uh, not only uh, the very idea of the recovery fund, uh, uh, but also uh, the fact that those funds should be used primarily to pursue some key um, objectives on, on uh, the Commission and the Union's agenda, such as uh, uh, the new Green Deal and the transition to a digital economy. Uh, the fact that uh, the funding scheme uh, for this big plan contemplates uh, move in the direction of uh, one of uh, the commissions and also the parliament's uh, hobby horses, namely the idea of new uh, own resources for the uh, EU budget. All this uh, gives uh, a strong impression that this time, unlike in the previous crisis, uh, the agenda setting uh, was clearly done by supranational organizations. And that, I repeat, is a major difference. Now, uh, since you kindly invited uh, someone la like me, namely an academic, to take part in the discussion, uh, you must, of course, expect to be faced with an attempt at drawing some uh, uh, broader, longer-term conclusion on uh, uh, a question uh, uh, such as that of uh, institutional change. And, here, the two points uh, of that kind I would offer uh, are the following. First of all, uh, what we've learned in uh, the response to the previous crisis, as well as in the response to the COVID crisis, is that uh, very often change uh, in the EU is of an incremental nature. It's rarely, if ever, the product of some kind of grand design. It builds upon the acute uh, of previous uh, experiences of cooperation and from the lessons uh, drawn uh, from uh, cooperation in earlier stages. Uh, and secondly, in that framework, it's not rare to see European institutions acquire powers that initially they had been denied. And of course, the, the most uh, revealing example, uh, the most telling example of that kind of development is the transformation of the European Central Bank, uh, which when it was established was explicitly denied uh, the, the role of a lender of last resort, which is that of central banks in the national setting, or any uh, possibility to act as a regulator uh, in the banking market. That was discussed, that was turned down. The situation now is that de facto and uh, arguably also uh, uh, de jure, uh, the, uh, uh, the ECB has acquired powers in uh, those two areas. Not because somebody uh, had the idea of uh, suggesting it was necessary, but because the Union was confronted with such dramatic crises that it was felt indispensable to confer upon it uh, greater power. And I think this is something to be uh, remembered uh, when we think about the future 
uh, if uh, we want uh, discussions to be of some help. I mean, the, the, the one lesson uh, I think needs to be drawn from uh, uh, the past, uh, and that includes the recent past, is that functional uh, integration is uh, what works best at the European level. Governments uh, need to agree on joint challenges, on, on the existence of joint challenges and uh, on joint objectives before they can agree to act together uh, at the European level and, and possibly to transfer more powers to the Union. That, of course, is also a lot to do with uh, the uh, requirement of unanimity for uh, major decisions, including decisions on institutional reform at the European level. Turning to democracy, I would argue that there are also uh, a few things that we need to uh, think about uh, when looking back at uh, the experience of the past uh, few months. And here I would say the record is mixed. If you try to analyze uh, national and European responses from the standpoint of democracy, uh, I think you're bound to say that there are negative aspects and there are positive aspects. There are negative aspects because governments have uh, largely used and, according to me, at times abused of uh, their emergency powers. Uh, it's not clear to me that uh, everything uh, that uh, uh, needs to be decided uh, uh, in relation to uh, a pandemic needs to be adopted under emergency powers, and yet this is uh, what has been done in a number of countries uh, at times at a certain price uh, when it came to uh, uh, the respect uh, for the rule of law. Um, but uh, it's also clear that uh, we, uh, we were confronted with a very difficult problem. We were confronted with a, technics, uh, a complex technical issue uh, and over which the scientific evidence was uh, subject to contradictory interpretation. So that too is, uh, not, if not a new problem, is a situation for which our democracies are not well equipped. Why, what do we do when experts seem to know better than anybody else? Should we uh, give them the upper hand on any decision or not? Uh, uh, that's uh, far from being a simple uh, question. To make things worse, this uh, question uh, had to be uh, tackled at a time characterized by a fairly deep degree of mistrust in expertise and, and authority. And uh, uh, it certainly undermined uh, the trust in uh, public institutions in uh, many countries. On the positive side, however, I think that there are also things to be noticed. Uh, we've seen that parliaments, uh, and notably the uh, European Parliament, uh, have uh, adjusted uh, in an innovative way to, the, to this uh, challenging situation. They've discovered the interest of, uh, uh, of remote participation and virtual debates. Uh, uh, we had also uh, uh, a greater resort to uh, virtual vote uh, with uh, a greater use of roll calls, for instance, in the European Parliament, which shows that parliaments could not only adjust to the unprecedented situation we were in, but also perhaps innovate in, uh, uh, in some areas. Uh, what I mean by this is that uh, our discussion today is a good example of the fact that we've all acquired a, a greater family, familiarity with online communication and we're better able uh, to use uh, uh, digital communication devices uh, than in the past. Well, I would argue that this is an innovation that has great democratic uh, potential. Uh, it has uh, potential because essentially it makes it easier uh, for a, a greater uh, range of people to participate in public debates. I think it's very relevant in a period where uh, uh, we see very well that the distance between uh, representatives and their citizens is becoming more and more of a problem. Um, 
it's of course a problem that's well known in uh, the European political system, where by definition, because of size uh, uh, um, considerations, uh, the distance between uh, voters and their representatives tends uh, to be higher than in, in the member states. Now, the big challenge for us, all of us, uh, is can we build on this greater, uh, uh, I won't say technological development because nobody invented anything new uh, in, the, uh, in the field of uh, online uh, technology in recent months. But in the, the familiarity we have gained with those instruments, can we build on this development to improve our democracies? Uh, and I would argue that uh, yes, there is something that we can learn and uh, that we should think of uh, using more uh, systematically. Um, I know that some people dream of uh, forms of direct democracy and citizens' assemblies, but uh, while recognizing that uh, this is one option, I would uh, also uh, suggest that there's another way uh, we may think uh, about uh, those new instruments, which is in what way could we use them to strengthen representative democracy because i think that there is an unexploited potential at that level we could use uh, uh, new media in order to better connect uh, representatives with their constituents to organize regular dialogues uh, with the citizenry to facilitate uh, structured uh, discussions with uh, special uh, categories of stakeholders to uh, improve accountability and so on and so forth uh, I don't believe, in other words, that uh, uh, the development of uh, digital uh, democracy needs necessarily to, uh, uh, or will necessarily conduct to uh, um, a weakening of uh, representative democracy. I think the opposite is true if we can use uh, the, uh, those instruments that we have discovered uh, somewhat uh, uh, cleverly. I don't have any blueprint to propose, but I would argue that this is something that needs to be explored and uh, uh, that uh, if uh, we manage to get uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe uh, on the right tracks, this is an issue which really should be uh, given consideration. Which brings me to my uh, final set of considerations. What to do of uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe? Uh, uh, President Bertrand's invitation uh, raised the question, how can we make a success of this, uh, of the plural debate uh, that is expected? And uh, it's a good question because uh, the answer is difficult. We know that uh, there is in Europe a very wide diversity of views uh, concerning the political uh, finalité of uh, the Union. It's probably the diversity is uh, greater today than it's ever been. Uh, and, but I would argue that precisely because it is great, uh, we should really think carefully about how to organize discussion in the framework of the conference. We, we've witnessed in the past that uh, big discussions on principles and institutional matters have rarely been successful. Which is why I would argue that uh, the one key to uh, success is to focus on what unites uh, rather than what divides us. And uh, returning to my initial considerations, I would say that uh, we must keep in mind that uh, integration is more often than not driven by functional needs. Uh, if you accept that premise, then you will accept that uh, uh, the corollary, namely that agreement on common objectives, is required for any progress. The first task is therefore to identify uh, challenges uh, to which we need or we want to uh, respond together. And the good news in that respect is that, as we just heard uh, in, uh, in the panel uh, that started this uh, event, there is no shortage of uh, challenges uh, uh, for which indeed uh, joint action of European countries would be uh, required uh, from climate change to migrations or to international security without of course forgetting health issues where 
which have uh, uh, now a clearly demonstrated uh, transnational dimension, on all these uh, levels, it is clear that action at state level is not uh, no longer sufficient if, if we want to achieve uh, satisfactory results. And mutatis mutandis, I would say the same in relation to uh, international uh, action. Uh, we know that uh, in today's world, uh, no European country is really uh, sufficiently strong to act on its own uh, on the world scene. Uh, it follows that if they want their interest uh, to be considered on the world scene, uh, they must find ways to act together. So no shortage of uh, challenges uh, to be brought to uh, the attention of uh, uh, governments. But there is, of course, a but. And the but is that... Uh, One minute for your but. Thank you. Uh, that will suffice. The but is that uh, what we've also witnessed in recent years is that functional integration uh, may be uh, the key to movement, but it also breeds resistance. Uh, indeed, did we not see in recent years at two contradictory movements at the same time substantial transfers to authority to the Union and uh, uh, in parallel the growth of populist movements uh, with a strong anti-European dimension. That's the paradox of our time. We, we now, uh, there was a time where uh, people regretted the absence of attention paid to European issues. It's no longer the case. They are, uh, they are to be seen even in domestic elections. The problem is that more often than not, it is uh, they are used by anti-European movements and leaders. So, uh, so that uh, uh, strangely, the uh, integration process ends up having a destructuring aspect uh, on uh, uh, destructuring effect on uh, national pol political systems without yet uh, leading to the consolidation of a political system at the uh, European level. So we need to square that kind of circle. And I would argue that if there is one issue uh, that should really be given uh, uh, attention in uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe, it is uh, the question of responsiveness of European policies to uh, uh, the concerns of uh, uh, citizens at large. Citizens at large, if you look at Eurobarometers, uh, they do understand uh, the necessity for uh, cooperation at European level uh, on uh, so many issues. What they tend to dispute is uh, the way uh, the uh, EU is organized in order to respond to their concern. Rightly or wrongly, they have the impression that their voice does not matter much. And that's exactly the problem we need to address. How can we find ways in order to uh, make it uh, possible for citizens to feel that uh, their voice matters and is heard by the European institution? If I have no pet instrument, uh, we may talk about Spitzenkandidat and we may talk about transnational list, we may talk about a better structuring of party politics at the European level. I would say, Let's have no uh, preference for any one of these instruments. There are but instruments of a broader cause, which is to make it uh, possible for citizens to weigh more on the choices that are made at uh, the European level. If we manage to address that problem, uh, uh, in all likelihood, uh, there will, the, the Conference on the Future of Europe will uh, lead to interesting and constructive uh, results. If we don't, uh, the likelihood is that it will generate just one more report that will collect dust on the shelves of libraries. And I will stop uh, thanking you for your attention. Thank you so much. Can I ask our panelists to switch the microphones back on, please, as well? Well, no, thank you so much for that. I'm going to pick up on some of those themes just now as well. Uh, let me start with uh, Jürgen and Reno. You touched on similar themes. Jürgen, speaking about the selfishness um, of nations at the beginning of the COVID crisis. And uh, Renault touched on the selfishness of nations 
uh, courtesy of uh, Nicolas Sarkozy in uh, 2008 as well. There are some parallels, but there are also a lot of differences. The speed of change, the speed uh, of action this time around uh, was substantially faster. And I'm going to touch a lot on the learning process of Europe. Jürgen, why do you think it was different this time? Uh, first, I think we have to, uh, to first uh, to see that we, we learned during the Corona crisis. And uh, we have to state that we have been speeding up to a certain extent uh, during the crisis. But um, in the beginning of the pandemic, the EU clearly lacks in instruments to fight uh, the global uh, pandemic in a transnational way. We fought back in our national patterns um, to answer this crisis. And um, uh, even the reaction of the European Commission was very, very slow and countries have then, uh, they dare to introduce even non-tariff barriers uh, such as the prohibition to export masks uh, medical masks to countries that were, I have to admit, that have seriously be affected by the crisis. And uh, some member states, um, as I mentioned before, started to take severe actions close to close their borders and restricted basic civil liberties uh, in an unprecedented um, extent sometimes. And um, do you think that matters now? Do you think that it seems that the mass crisis and the selfishness of mass distribution seems a terribly long time away, even though it was only a few short months? Because yes. the, the bazooka of the, the fixed budget and uh, the forward planning that's happening now seems so much more dynamic, so much larger than that. Would you agree? Yes, yes. But it was, um, it was a little bit spooky to see in the beginning the, these confused, um, uncoordinated, confused and helpless reactions to see. And then I, see, I think the bazooka was uh, quite the counter reaction on, the, uh, on that very weak, on, the, on, the, on that, that very weak opening uh, in the fight of the corona pandemic. Then uh, the, the finance ministers they, uh, they, they knew they have to find a common approach. And this was, uh, must have been uh, bazooka okay, let, me, size let me ask Hansgut. Hansgut, do you see the, what happened with the COVID crisis in terms of short-term and long-term implications? That the lesson uh, learned in terms of uh, the, the selfishness at the beginning of the crisis becoming a, a big play on the, the economy. Was this driven by finance ministers that were terrified of a repeat of 2008? So it was actually an economic crisis that motivated this, not the health crisis? How do you see it? Thank you very much, Brian. If you allow me, I would like to make uh, uh, a sentence, a remark uh, to Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, I did not know this sure he's phrase. Online. <laughs> I did not know that he made the statement that it was now the challenge of the nation state. Maybe that he said it, and if somebody from your side said it, uh, then it will certainly be true. But my experience with Nicolas Sarkozy was that he was very European. When the uh, constitutional treaty failed in France, he said, We will have a new treaty, and it will be ratified in the two chambers. Uh, in the Assembly and in the Senate, and he did it. And it was in the French presidency, the second part of 2008, that he wanted to get a result concerning climate change. And the, uh, the French government worked very, very hard to get a result which we uh, finally got in the French presidency. So I think uh, Nicolas Sarkozy is much more European as it seemed uh, to be in our, uh, our discussion quoting. But now, Brian, coming to your question, I think we made at the beginning of coronavirus uh, mistakes and we saw the European Union again in borders, borders nation state. And I think our governments have realized now that thinking in, in, in borders of the nation state is wrong. We have to identify what we do now, regions where we have an increase of coronavirus and so on. I think this is the right method and not to come back to the uh, formal, former uh, borders. And I think uh, 
uh, we have made mistakes. My country has made mistakes. Uh, the, we um, had a uh, verordnung, I don't know what, a directive or something, that we should not send our uh, our mask and so on, medical uh, medical things and so on to other countries. And we realized immediately in Germany that we made a mistake. And I think, and now I'm coming to the end with my statement concerning this, I think we have realized now with the coronavirus that we need a better cooperation, integration in the field of health. And I think this is a very important point for the uh, conference, uh, for the conference uh, Future of Europe to which uh, Professor De Hoos uh, uh, referred, that we give more competences to the European Union in this field, but always with the possibility of subsidiarity. All levels have to work together, the local level, the regional level, the national level, and the European level, and the European level should create an umbrella for the national and regional and local level. I think that's an important point that we should be looking at regions, not nations, because that's basically how it's functioning today, but to do this in a more structured way for the future. Uh, Let's uh, go to the, the Slovakia team. And uh, Commissioner Sechovic is now charged with uh, looking at foresight for Europe as well. And just follow what Hans Gerd says, part of this problem is that we didn't have foresight over problems. Now, the World Health Organization was talking for years. I used to work as a healthcare reporter. Every year we'd write the, the pandemic report and it was the same. And they would say, it's coming and governments aren't ready. And now Europe seems to have got the message that if you don't plan, you absolutely fail on a grand scale. Uh, how do you how do you see uh, this changing now? Is Europe ready for uh, to, to to function in a new way with greater harmony, but outside of the crisis zone with better planning? You are speaking. Huh? Sorry. To, so, to, to Nicholas first. Oh, okay. Look, uh, to some extent, I feel a, a slight pessim pessimism. On the other side, I understand such a move. Uh, the reason why I feel a bit pessimism is the reality that who would set 15 years ago or when Slovakia had been uh, received as EU member that in a few years we will face something like a global financial crisis. I remember the sunny day in Dublin when uh, we had big bank of the EU. The, the, sunny two, day. the two sunny days in Ireland ever. Unbelievable, right, believe me. Everybody was very happy. Uh, Jacques Chirag and Kwasniewski from Poland, a lot of jokes, uh, happiness. Who would have said at the time what will happen 2007, 2008, including me? The second issue is immigration. Who would predict that? Not speaking about Corona crisis. So this is the, 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 the reason why I feel a bit pessimism when speaking about, you know, forecasts or predictions, something, something like that. On the other hand, as a politician, I have a kind of understanding for that. Not only because Shevchovich needs a portfolio, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, also, but also in reality, it would be good to have not precise, precise prediction, but to deal with some scenarios, some alternatives. When it comes to immigration, for instance, I believe it is possible to do, to make, to produce some alternatives. So in general, I, I welcome this move. And I believe that she, because I know Shevchovich, he was a diplomat in my time, very, 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 very clever, very hard uh, working guy. So I believe that he will not sleep, but he will, he will bring something to, on the table. Uh, yeah, what you say, about not having seen these things coming. You know, the pandemic, WHO was saying this for a long time. Migration, I was covering migration stories and the predictions for what was happening. We can see now what's going to happen in Africa as well. We're heading for a food crisis and we're looking at 400 million Africans uh, with uh, literally no food uh, on the table and where they're going to come to. And like Hans Gert was saying earlier, we have uh, the introductory remarks. We need to think bigger in terms of how we solve these, these uh, problems too. It is, you know, it, this looks to me like a maturing democracy, a, a model which is self-confident enough to say, look, we're dealing with day-to-day uh, -day stuff reasonably well. Um, we, we can now look forward and plan 
because they're, they look at the United States, the pandemic team was dismantled on, under President Trump as well, but there was foresight for that already. Um, I just want to switch the topic now to uh, a little bit on, on the, the economy and digital uh, workplace as well. And it's not disconnected from that because you know, if we don't get this foresight right, if we don't look at where artificial intelligence is going, if we don't look at what social equality is going to look like, uh, Maria Joao, we've spoken about this before, you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, how uh, universal basic income has got to be on the table as a discussion point as well because so many people will lose their jobs. And as Christine Lagarde said just a couple of months ago as well, this was coming anyway. COVID has accelerated uh, the artificial intelligence uh, input into to manufacturing in the industry and uh, into white collar jobs, uh, especially now as well, not just blue collar jobs. What do you expect from Europe now uh, for the short term and for the long term that's changed because of COVID in terms of the economy and the social model? Yeah. Look, uh, I think it's better for us to assume that, of course, we cannot predict everything which is coming, for sure. We must be prepared for many surprises, as uh, we are having all the time. But on the other hand, there are issues we can predict as remaining key issues. One will be the climate change. This is happening in front of us. Other one will be the issue we are now raising is the implications of the digital revolution. Uh, because this is changing completely the way we work, we live, where we have access to education. Um, there are very positive implications, a lot of potential. Uh, example on the, the way to have access to education, to knowledge, to organize the democratic debate. But there are also risks, yes. Uh, and uh, the fact that um, artificial intelligence combined with robots uh, is changing completely the way companies work mm, can lead to uh, the loss of many jobs. Yes. So what should we do? Mm? Because we know this is about to happen. Well, the first thing we need to do is to prepare people with the right kind of education and skills to move to these new kind of jobs. So a massive education training program should be really a priority for us. The second one is to support our SMEs uh, to drive this potential uh, for our social needs in health, in a green transition, in cities uh, management, because uh, like that, we can create new jobs and new activities. Mm -hmm. And I would like to emphasize this, to create new jobs, uh, because now we have a lot of talk that uh, in, at the end of the day, it's better to prepare people uh, for not having jobs and just having a kind of minimum income. Look, uh, I don't like very much this kind of solution. I really think that we need to make our utmost to provide to uh, most of European citizens uh, meaningful jobs, rewarding jobs with decent conditions. But this means to be very agile with the uh, innovation policy, with regional policy, uh, and uh, with an active job creation policy. Uh, this is my take. And this shows very well that uh, by predicting that there is a trend out there on the digital transformation, we can uh, avoid the losses and improve the benefits with a very active innovation and the education policy. Thank so this is my take on this. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne, in terms of the green economy, can we soak up the excess uh, employment that, that reserve is going to be there because the labor reserve is going to be there because of AI uh, changing the workplace and reinvest that human capital in the new green economy. Can do, how do the figures look for that? Do you, do you see sufficient capacity within Europe to reskill uh, and to innovate to bridge that gap? Or are we just going to be looking at a, a big a part of the, the, the currently employed sector with our jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. But let me say something for the debate before I would like something, uh, because I think what we have seen in the, in, the, in the Corona crisis at the beginning is that we are really facing different realities. 
in Europe and that it costs us to understand that there are different realities. Until we have realized how is the situation and how it's the situation really in Italy, uh, it has taken, it, it, it was still a long time, it was far away uh, in other parts of Europe. So uh, I think uh, we have still borders. Uh, not only we are rising borders in the, have rise borders in this time, we have borders in our heads. And I think there we, we need a lot of work and therefore, especially as particular foundation, we need to work on to, to go there for a globalization. That uh, it has not to be a fire in Moria that we realize that this has something to do with us. And it has to be not uh, that we see here uh, where we live that it's 1.5 uh, uh, rising the temperature that we have a, a, a climate crisis that this is this is really near so i think yeah it's a lot of work uh, we of educational work and of of political uh, uh, political debates and wh where we have to get to the people and i liked what you said before um, uh, mr dehos uh, we need the dialogue. We need a dialogue with our with our civil society uh, for to bring them in and to to realize that Europe is important. One side is the institutions and the, the organization and the changing maybe of of and to make it transparent and so on. But the other thing is really if we use if we lose this dialogue with the people and if Europe is not doing something that is useful for them, then then we have a really big problem of this. But Susan, and it don't brings you, me to the point. Yeah, yeah the sorry. Backing, your point just a second, but but Europe, Europe is doing clearly a lot of good work, and we had the point made earlier that, yeah. and yet the populism is rising. This, this, uh, I think it was Renaud made the, this uh, comment earlier. You know, we we have Europe on the political agenda, but it's always for the negative reasons, and yet Europe is uh, communicating poorly its successes. Um, I think France, remarkably for a change, uh, uh, applauded uh, President Macron when he got this big finance deal together. His approval ratings went up, and that's not normal. Normally, there's there's either no impact at all, or it's uh, turned around as somehow caving into a European agenda. You know, how do you think civil society can really make a difference in communicating the value of the European approach and the changes that are necessary uh, to bind in European citizens to the future of Europe? Yeah, on one hand, it's really what you say. We have more, more to talk about what's the positive things and we have a lot of solutions and we have a lot of practice already and uh, there are ideas and with this we have to put in practice so we have to talk about more it and to di dialogue this with the people what you're already doing and what what is on the positive way like this and on the other hand i think we have to 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 pick up issues and themes what are important for the people and uh, uh back to this ubi yes uh for me it's not only for to the base and this means at the same time also to talk about jobs and creation of new jobs, of environmental new jobs, of possibilities for people to be part, active part of the, of the society. We have there are a lot of good ideas and Europe has a lot of uh, politi uh, politics already putting into practice and there is much to do and this we have to communicate and to bring it in. Um, Let me go to, to Jürgen now. Is to, I want to talk a little bit about the global stage. Do you see opportunity, Jürgen, in uh, China's um, public relations problems, to put it delicately, uh, as a consequence of COVID? Do you see that, not that I want to characterize China as an enemy per se, but that it's useful to have an opponent uh, when you're framing, uh, training your own team? Does Europe benefit as an entity from having clear opposition outside our borders now, uh, not really having a strong part in the United States, having clear opposition on so many fronts uh, with China. Uh, how, how, you're an optimistic liberal. How do you see this shaping the future of Europe? At first, I think um, it would be better if we would be surrounded by friends at first. So, um, and I'm convinced that we don't need um, conflicts to find ourselves, to find a common, um, a common approach. But I, uh, I see and uh, I think that's a very simple truth that external oppression um, helps to, to, to stick together and uh, unifies to a certain extent uh, the European Union. It's sad to, uh, that we have to constate this, but um, on the other hand, um, all saying never miss a good crisis. Yes, um, uh, favorite approach to, to life. Yeah, so uh, you, you know this, and 
um, I, I, I'm sure we will find a way to handle the, the challenges, for instance, on the on the field of human rights in China and um, to and to stay in contact with China, um, to to say critical words, uh, but not only to to block and uh, to cut off all uh, all the contacts. Saying to Belarus or to to, to Russia, um, we have to stay and we have to talk to neighbors uh, or others, even if they become uh, complicated or weird or something like that. Um, okay, that's the world it goes. And but I'm convinced um, we will find a common way and common ends. Okay. Nicholas, let's uh, return to you. you. You identify these issues as well. You need to talk about preparation, fiscal consolidation, for example, things like this. What do we need to prepare for now in terms of uh, the quality of our democracy? And I don't just mean putting new systems in place for judicial uh, process or new checks and balances like that. What, you know, what is it that influences, that, that brings in our citizens to allow us to move forward with a stronger democracy? I see it linked to the economy, to, to the strong How do you see it? Um, a very complex issue, a very complex issue. Look, uh, I, I fully agree with those who are calling for a more intensive and productive work with the public. Because now it is very popular when we speak about spending money. Everybody is waiting for a miracle. Slovakia will receive seven and a half billion euros and nobody knows how, how to spend money. I am, I am lost in this space. All my life, it was about saving and then investments. And the, all the time we spoke about economic effectiveness and some, something like that. And nobody is raising the issue that the day will come when this money should be repaid. We need to prepare public for such a situation. Because look, this is not only about pandemic. This is also about immigration. This is also about defense. This is, this is also about digitalization. I, I learned that uh, today we miss 200 billion euros on annual basis for fulfilling our digital plans. It is plenty of money, huge money. And we have also green deal, which will be very costly. So we need to work with the public, not to, not to scare them, but to prepare them for reforms for doing something substantial to collect money and to spend money very effectively. This is a huge challenge yes. for all our foundations. And don't, don't you think that part of the problem is that it is, is seen as so abstract, I put this question to all of you, it's seen as so abstract uh, to the European citizen that we talk about reform and it's reform for what? But when you put it in the context of a crisis like COVID, when we have so many of these dimensions in place simultaneously, we have a, a window of opportunity and it will close for a time until the next pandemic. We have a window of opportunity where we can explain, look, we need to have the pre preparation. We need to invest in this type of healthcare. We need to invest in this kind of planning. We need to have all these resources and we need to reorganize Europe to be able to cope with this better. So you, do, you, do you think that if we don't act now to get, bring these messages across, that window will close or will we just learn from this and deal with it the next time? Good. I, I agree with you that this time is very fruitful to do that. Okay. But uh, we, we are waiting. We are waiting and I am calling for better acceleration, uh, how to talk to, to the people. But you are, you are very right. Uh, Ten years ago, in time of financial crisis, nobody in my country or the region understood why our countries being poor should participate to save Greece. But now people understand much better that we are on the same boat. So this, this time is very fruitful to okay. talk to people openly and honestly. Thank you, excellent point. Hans Gerd, your response to that? Yeah, I think we need results uh, in the European Union. If you see the opinion polls, the people, the citizens are asking for a common foreign security and defense policy, and we need it. It's a question of political will of our governments uh, to go the way of finally having a European army so difficult it might be. But it's not impossible. Those people who say it's impossible have no vision. And Helmut Kohl, the honorary citizen of Europe, unfortunately he is uh, dead now, he said the people who have visions are the real realists. And so we have to look forward and to ha we have to have to the will uh, to, to cooperate. And, and one of 
the major questions besides um, the Green Deal and beside uh, digitalization is a question of migration. If we don't solve this problem, then we are in great danger in the European Union. And uh, this is a psychological challenge as well for our Eastern countries in the European Union. But finally, we have to find a re resolution for that because it's not only a political question, it's a question of deep human dimension. And I think if we, if we get results, then the people will accept more the European Union, because they, they expect uh, solutions from the European Union. What do you see in terms of Europe on the global stage, um, our capacity uh, to, to join these dots about having action in Africa, for example, and, and solving a uh, food uh, crisis, which is, is pending, and at the same time communicating that to the citizens and explaining why we're investing billions of euros in Africa, when basically it's a humanitarian issue, yes, but basically we're trying to stop a, a massive migration flow which will crush European democracy in the medium term. How do you think we do this? Yeah, look, uh, definitely I do think that we need to invent a new kind of partnership in European Union Africa. This will be a top priority for the next period. There is a reason for this already refer is that uh, we need to prevent somehow an uncontrolled uh, migration movement. Uh, this is the risky part of the, the relationship. But we should also make the best of the positive part. Because this can also be a win-win eh, for Europe and uh, Africa. If we think about new sources of energy, uh, if uh, we think about uh, the way to organize our trade relationship, uh, the, the opportunities for Africa to develop, well, we can also benefit a lot from, uh, from this. Hmm? So this should be our approach on Africa. But of course, this means uh, for European Union to have a stronger budgetary means. For many reasons we already refer in this debate, uh, the energy, uh, climate transition, the digital, the population, we do need to have stronger budgetary capacity in the European Union. Uh, some people are a bit afraid this will translate into more taxes. Let me be very clear about this. We are not at all speaking about raising taxation on citizens, at all. The thing we are talking about is to go to new sources of taxation of those who are creating a lot of added value, such as in the digital or in the financial, and they don't pay the uh, fair taxes they should pay. Or we are talking about those who pollute. Mm? But uh, it's out of question to raise taxation citizens. On the contrary, this should be uh, reduced. Mm? But this, uh, just to, to, to clarify this point, because it does seem, uh, again, to, to, to President Macron, the Gilets Jaunes grew out of the very fact that uh, we tried to pass on taxation to fuel to people who simply refuse to pay to carry that burden any longer. Uh, let's to come back to this in the questions I have just a moment. Yeah, and just, yeah. just, uh, we're going to come to the questions and answers. We're getting lots of questions in uh, and now as well. So another couple of minutes, we're going to switch over to, to the Q&A. Uh, but uh, let's, let's continue with this point and ask uh, Renaud also, do you have a, a remark on this? How, how do you see uh, this changing? How do, you, how do you see this playing out? No, there, there is, um, it's clear that uh, the crisis situation uh, present all sorts of good opportunities to uh, think of new problems and revisit old problems. And uh, uh, it would be a pity if we did not uh, seize uh, this opportunity. Uh, it's entirely true that uh, Europe's first reaction was anything but glorious, uh, but it's I think uh, also to be said that it, it it could change gear pretty rapidly. That's the most remarkable thing. We yeah, were all there. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that we did adjust. Uh, Europe is kind of a diesel engine. It, ne it never takes off very rapidly uh, like a rocket going to the moon. But this time it's moved by its standards uh, rather fast. and. Uh, in a dimension which is also a complex, uh, let's say, multi-dimensional. 
it's dealt with the health uh, crisis to the extent it could, because of course uh, health is primarily a, a national competence. Uh, but it also immediately saw that there were to, to be uh, economic and social consequences, and it could anticipate uh, those uh, uh, to some extent, uh, in the sense that it could trigger discussion that uh, ultimately led to decision, which of course needs to be finessed and implemented, but uh, on the whole, um, I think this gives reasons to hope that it will adjust uh, uh, also to the other challenges. And I mean, the debate has illustrated the range of internal uh, and external challenges. Uh, so well, there is a Then bring Susanna, I think Jürgen has hand up as well, wanted to make a, a point. So let me bring to Susanna first. I think you probably prefer a hydrogen uh, car uh, for description for Europe rather than a diesel one, I would guess. But you wanted to make a point a moment ago yeah then. and i think it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting point uh, uh the question of how we're going to finance it because well then we're going back to something like environmental taxes or tobin taxes and so on so this is something also not a new debate uh we we, ha we have to find we have to find ways uh, uh to to not to let not only to use the money now and to have a big gap in the future and we will have to have at the same time how we finance now uh, this uh, situation of uh, post-covid and which are we actually in, po in not post we are still in covid and then uh, put this in in uh, uh, in a, a distance or in a in a in, pro in a opposite uh, to the long term uh, financial point so we will have to think about a, a lot of new ideas and i would like to come to one point back what i said before uh, when we talk about migration, we have to think about that this has also to do with our uh, lifestyle and the way how we deal uh, with it. Because the uh, thing is how we deal with or how we organize our, our relationships with Africa with other, uh, other countries, other, uh, um, uh, other regions in the world. But at the same time that as everything is connected, it has to do with how we are part of what we have to change our part of economy to uh, circle economy and so on and that was what i said before we have much more uh, we have a lot of good ideas and we have to put them in practice and to talk about it. thank you suzanne uh, just the last word before we go to questions uh jürgen jürgen you put your microphone on there and uh, do you have a quick comment before we move on on financing the future no thanks <laughs> <laughs> You raised your hand earlier. Okay, well, let's go oh, to the question. No, we have, no, no, seriously, we have, if, if, if we want to discuss how to finance the, like, the, the future, then we have to ask and to answer um, some more questions concerning the structure um, of, the, of the union and um, its competences and the control of these, uh, of these finances uh, by the parliament, for instance, um, or by the member states, and um, this has to be, be solved. And um, first, I want to, uh, to create the structures and become clear um, of the conditions. And then I, I, I'd like to, to discuss uh, new f um, finance sources or something, uh, taxation and, and these are first step first. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, go to some questions here. So from Bruno, sorry, I don't have your surname, Bruno. The foundation of democracy is the rule of law. How can the EU enhance its credibility on the pan-European scene, for example, in democracy in Belarus, when it has not yet assumed its responsibilities in the face of attacks on the rule of law in several of its member states, notably Hungary, Poland, and Bulgaria? Nicholas. Yeah, that question is uh, very complicated. Look, we need courage, leadership. We can uh, not only demonstrate, but also argue that uh, to stick to democratic principles, to pluralism, to liberal democracy principles is much per more perspective than to develop uh, a brutal or a robust policy. I have my own experience with my predecessor. You are very young, but uh, maybe you remember the name Mr. Mechia. It was 90s and Slovakia was excluded from, uh, from EU negotiations. Our neighbors, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, got the invitation to join NATO and to 
launch their negotiation with the, the EU, Slovakia, my country, had been excluded. And it was very difficult to beat my predecessor because he was not a Democrat. But in these days, he's happy because he's forgotten. But not everybody can be forgotten. So my message is very clear. We need to talk to these people inside the EU that it is not very perspective to build, you know, uh, autocracy, not speaking about uh, new totalities. The second dimension of your question is our position towards, uh, for instance, neighboring countries such as Belarus. We should be vocal, we should be quick, and we should stick to our principles, sanctions quick, influential, strong sanctions, not to interfere into domestic issues, but to respond quickly and strongly with one voice. Thank you. Anyone else want to offer comment on this? No, let me move on. Uh, Jean-Pierre Audi says, I can confirm that Nicosi is a great European. Thank you for that. I'm sure we all agree. And uh, Margarita, I think your name's surname is uh, Lithuanian, and I'm going to mispronounce it, but I apologize. Uh, Margarita Skorogovicu, I'm sorry. I have a lot of concerns about the ability of the EU to defend our own interests internationally. It should also be addressed. And uh, Sofia Kukovic as well. We need better EU cooperation regarding COVID-19, as Dr. Puttering said. And uh, we're confirming that John uh, Sarkozy is also a European, so more discussion on that. Health deserves, Nora Bella uh, says, health deserves more integrated policies to be able to have appropriate common reactions in front of the health crisis. And some other questions here. Okay, former member Jean-Pierre Audi here again. What is your opinion of the joint debt plan of 750 billion euros proposed by the heads of state or government without knowing how these debts will be repaid? Do you think the EU could disappear. Uh, Nicholas, you, I can predict your answer to this. I'm going to give it to someone else for just a moment. Um, Hans Gert. I think this uh, decision of the European Council was and is very important, and I support this decision having 750 billion euros. But now the very important question is, and I refer to what Mikula Schurinda has said, now we have to give an answer how we should use the money. And we have to use it uh, for subjects or objects for problems which are really oriented to the future. Uh, the Green Deal, digitalization, uh, human aid even with, uh, with Africa and, and so on. And we have to find a way to support uh, our young generation, Erasmus, in the multinational uh, multi uh, in this MFF, the multi years uh, financial framework, financial framework, the budget. The, man the budget. Thank you very much, Brian. The money for the MFF concerning Erasmus was reduced by the council in, in, in reference to the commission. The commission wanted much more. The parliament wanted much more. And my advice to the European parliament is to fight for Erasmus, because this is something for the future, for the young people. Not only that they understand each other, but that they develop new, uh, new technologies and so on and, and so on. And I think it's now the task of the European Parliament to say more concretely for what these 750 billion euros should be used. And I can only encourage the European Parliament to be strong and not uh, leave this question only to the, to the governments, which are normally thinking in national uh, considerations. So I think this is a great responsibility now for the European Parliament. I think what we see in Spain, uh, youth unemployment, uh, Eurostat put out statistics the other day, um, Eurostat said 41.7% of youth are still unemployed in Spain. I think uh, education from, should find its way through now 750. Jürgen, you have a point to make there? Yeah, just let me add something uh, Hans-Gerd Puttering said. Yes, uh, it's about the, the member states who are still, um, uh, they are still um, thinking in old patterns and old stuff. So they are, uh, it's all about uh, the common agriculture policy, structural fund, funds, 
and uh, very few investments into the future. Uh, for instance, now uh, the, the Commission's uh, program for science and innovation, the Horizon Europe program, has been reduced, for instance, now uh, by the Council from 94.4 billion down to 80 billion euros. And uh, that's only one example um, how th that there is a lot of uh, things uh, to, to, to be adjusted by the Parliament in the next um, rounds. Suzanne and Marie Joao? Yeah, I, I totally agree with, the, uh, with what you said. And I think this is now a chance because I, I'm, as I said, that we firm normally in Spain. And now it's a chance to use this uh, recovery fund to really uh, to, to make a switch and to make a change and to build up new sustainable jobs and to offer also really for the young people the possibility to, to, uh, to create something and to be there and to, to be on the spot. So I think there is now really a good chance. And I think there Europe has to look uh, and to be really that, that the national states are not looking too much in their, uh, in their uh, sayings. And I think this is a good possibility for, for these countries. So there we can, that in this, to invest, that a country like Spain is not really, uh, is still depending so much from the big uh, energy uh, producers and, and not to be in the, independent social in, in a solar level or in a in a transition energy transition level this is now a chance to to create new parts and new words and it would be a, a good point also on the to to bring to bring into in the democracy issue that the young people they are, that they see we are using these funds in the way uh, that it's also for their future thank you Marie, so i'm going to take I, a I mean, also on, on, on this, this. then uh, Renaud, i'm going to move on to another question for you okay Marie, so go ahead yeah well, in fact i'd like to uh, start from Renaud uh, in, in very interesting speech uh, some minutes ago uh, because yes i think he is right when he's underlined that we have a, a kind of interesting leap forward regarding uh, the recovery uh, fund which was created with a quite impressive size but let me underline that we still have two problems to solve. One is that uh, in order to have this strong recovery fund, uh, the European Council has reduced the resources for fundamental community programs. The Erasmus one, uh, Hans uh, Pottering just referred, the Connecting Europe, the Horizons, and uh, this should not be accepted. We do need to have strong community programs for this. Huh? So, and now this is in the hands of the European Parliament. And then there is a second problem for all, for all this to fly, is that uh, we need to create these new own resources. And this depends on the decision, not only of the European Parliament, but of the national parliaments. So, uh, all our network of connections across member states uh, should really be alert for this problem. We now are very enthusiastic about a, a big recovery plan, but this can only fly if uh, national parliaments endorse a decision to create new own resources. Thank you, Mr. We have a question now, uh, one of our public questions from Christophe Leclerc, who I know very well. He's the founder of Euractive, uh, Brussels' leading media agency. Uh, Christophe asks, the direct contact institutions and citizens sounds good, like direct democracy in Parliament. It is also flawed. What about the role of intermediaries, for example, the media? Renaud. Your microphone, there you go, microphone's on. Yes. It's clear that uh, there's no good democracy without good intermediaries. Uh, for me, uh, there's no question in a way. Uh, it, it is absolutely clear that uh, this is uh, consonant with the idea of a solid, healthy uh, European democracy. We need uh, a strong media system and we need a pan-European uh, uh, civil society, which we don't have. Both of them. I mean, we pan European media exists, but uh, their audience is limited, I regret to say. Uh, not everybody reads the Financial Times. Uh, we could, uh, of course, it's well read in Brussels, as we know, but it's not, it does not suffice. 
and uh, which is why I think it is important to structure debates in such a way that uh, one uh, interacts with all sorts of stakeholders, uh, uh, and that's a that's a major uh, investment. Now, if you allow me, I would also like to make a, uh, another remark on uh, uh, the, the question of on the question of uh, uh, financing. That is to say, I, I think. While I recognize uh, the difficulty, I mean, the debate on own resources is uh, not as old as uh, as the integration project, but almost. Uh, but uh, this time, there is an interesting constellation because there is an agreement to borrow some money. And I think there is no uh, appetite amongst governments to uh, uh, finance uh, any kind of reimbursement now or later. So by definition, uh, an, an alternative solution will have to be found, uh, which remains to be seen. But uh, uh, if uh, national parliaments uh, evoked by Maria Joao have a choice between paying themselves or finding a clever solution uh, in terms of own resources, maybe they will be well inspired. I'd just like to point out that the British paid off uh, the Dutch for the Napoleonic Wars about five years ago. So maybe the, the terms and conditions that we're dealing with can be extended for somebody else's generation to deal with. Uh, any other question, uh, responses here on the role of the media and the connecting uh, politics with uh, the citizens? Well, I'd like to come back on this because, uh, in fact, uh, Christophe Leclerc is completely right in raising the importance of... Uh, these mediators, it's impossible to have a uh, rich uh, democratic debate without having stronger, active uh, media actors. Uh, this is a major cause for us uh, and also supporting them in developing the European dimension because we still lack this uh, so-called European public sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, what is happening today with our debate is a good illustration how can we have a plural democratic debate with different opinions, also identifying some common grounds. Uh, but uh, this kind of debate should be in much more places of uh, communication. Uh, for this, we need to have very uh, strong, active, dynamic media uh, actors. Uh, and uh, otherwise, the risk is that European public sphere is uh, reshaped by other entities out of us, out of Europe, coming from Russia, from uh, China, from the uh, United States. Uh, so I think this is a major issue of European sovereignty. Yes. Thank Support you. European uh, media actors. I have a lot of questions here. So uh, what I'm going to do is just go through some of these more quickly. If we have more time, I would really like to uh, discuss the role of artificial intelligence in media as well and how strongly we need to protect independent media in Europe. If you haven't read it yet, I really recommend uh, Surveillance uh, Capitalism as a really long, dense read on what we're doing with our humanity through data and uh, the destruction of the media today. We have a question from a former member, uh, Bruno Bossier. Uh, Bruno asks, the foundation of democracy is the rule of law. Uh, we've had this question already, so we've got Bruno's name attached to it this time. Thank you. And uh, we have another one from Giorgio uh, Clorotti. It's my impression that the EP joining up with the NGOs wants a true bottom-up exercise, but the council does not. Am I right? Hans Gert? I did not correctly understand the question, yeah, but I want the, to say it, that the uh, non-governmental organizations are very, very important, and we should defend them, even if we do not always like what they are doing. And the council, do you think the council is opposed to NGOs? Yeah, I think there are different opinions in the Council. Some countries are more in favor of NGOs, others are more against. And I, in principle, uh, I am in favor of NGOs because they are doing something what the politicians sometimes don't do. And then we have to argue, of course. You have not always to agree to the NGOs, but they are so different, but we have to argue. And dialogue must be the basis of our communication. Okay, uh, another comment from Edward uh, Kozutsnik, a former member, I think. Uh, is there any possibility for further expansion of the EU in these strange times? Is it still alive or is it completely dead? Thank you. Uh, Jürgen, can we expand? 
Tony was just out of the line. No, go ahead. So the, do you think we can expand the EU at this, this moment or is this no. a completely dead no. subject? I think it would be very difficult, I, I, I think, um, uh, at this stage in the moment. And we need an animosity to, to expand. Uh, that doesn't mean that we could not enter into negotiations, uh, for instance. Uh, we had uh, already promised to, to, to North Macedonia, for instance, uh, that if they would solve their problems with, the, with, with Greece, we would, um, we would be able to enter into negotiations. Now it has been denied by the Council. And uh, this was a wrong decision, I think. Um, you can discuss the case in the case of Alban, uh, Albania um, to enter or not, but uh, I think um, in the case of North, North Macedonia, it was unfair um, not to, uh, to to start the negotiation, which doesn't mean that they would enter end of November next year. Um, this process, as we all know, uh, will take a lot of time, uh, up to 10 years, and uh, therefore we should be able to, to, to step, to take these steps, yes, to expand uh, at this moment, no. Thank you. Suzanne, you wanted to comment? Yeah, just, I, I think uh, we can not stop to, uh, are we, we, it's a complicated question, but what we cannot stop for sure is the dialogue. And we have to risen uh, this and to widen this up, uh, um, a dialogue with uh, the European countries uh, which are there and also, also the outside uh, European countries. If this lasts then uh, to negotiations or to, to, uh, uh, to, to new countries coming into the EU, this is, uh, this is something which will be developed, but what we will need internally in the EU is a debate and a, di in a, a dialogue with each other and also with the countries around us. Thank you, Miklas. I mean that we need or should keep our door open. I'm not calling for tomorrow's enlargement, but uh, thinking about Belarus in these days. Or the United Kingdom, for example. <laughs> this is another case, but you look at Ukraine. Maybe slow, but huge changes. And people are voting not only in Ukraine, but also in Belarus. So we need to encourage these positive processes in both directions, to the east, but also to the Western Balkans. Uh, I am well aware of the fact that the screening, how the criteria is met now will be much tougher than in my time. And this is good. This is very normal. And people understand this also in Kiev and Minsk, also in Belgrade. But they should know very, 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 very uh, clearly that if their, their adherence to the West is irreversible, if they are willing and able to meet criteria, they should be given the chance to join. Thank you. I have some other questions um, which were sent in a little earlier. Julian, I uh, hope you're online today, Joe. Uh, for a while. How should the EU position itself in the growing conflict between the US and China? We touched on this earlier. More specific recommendations, what should we do? I'd like to come on this, this one, yes. Yeah. Look, um, first of all, I think that um, Europe has a long tradition of relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. And this should be uh, kept, developed, even we must say that with the, the current presidency of the United States, this is not uh, being easy because it's against European positions in many, many fronts. The, the climate, uh, the peace and security, uh, the uh, health, uh, even the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to, wait, uh, to deal with China, uh, I don't think we just uh, need to align with the current uh, Trump position regarding China, antagonizing China in all fields. We need to have a very straightforward relationship with China. Uh, on some fields, we have uh, a convergent action. One example is the climate, is the support to development, on the other fields, we don't have at all the same opinion and we need to make it clear on the human rights, on the way to use the digital, we have big differences. And of course, China is not a democracy, which for us is a fundamental difference. 
Uh, but I think that we need to have uh, autonomous European strategy to deal with China. So this is my point. Thank you. Hans Gerd? Yes, I think it's very important for us as European Union that we say, despite the President of the United States, we are near to the United States, we are friends, we are partners, and we believe in the institutions of the United States of America. And the Chinese government, it's an ideology, and it's behaving badly concerning the Muslims in Uyghur, and I don't know what the English word is in the, in the western part of, of China. They are behaving badly in Tibet, they are behaving badly in Hong Kong, and they are threatening Taiwan. And I hope that the Western world, especially the United States, don't allow the Chinese to take Taiwan over. And we as European Union should be ready, of course, for dialogue, but not be dependent as far as Huawei is concerned, the new technologies. We have to be independent and should not give, up our, should not give our possibilities into uh, the hands of the Chinese communist totalitarian government. Jürgen. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, even if we complain about the, the rude behavior of Donald Trump, we should not forget that the U.S. system has its own checks and balances, and that um, standing for a quite stable uh, government and relationship between uh, the United States and Europe. On the other hand, we have to see that uh, China has only one simple oppressive um, system, and, uh, which is in, in, uh, in many points uh, strictly on the other side, diametral um, on the other side of, of our values. And uh, it's, it's very hard to, uh, to find a way to, 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 to act and to handle uh, this. Nicholas, tomorrow I'm, I'm moderating a, a briefing on a report, an annual report from the Chinese Chamber of Commerce to the EU. And in doing the briefing for this as well, it struck me just how dependent, and we know this, how, how dependent China is on Europe. And, you know, that China is looking to reestablish some kind of better relationship. You've got Huawei on one side, you have the health, uh, lack of trust, and you, know, you have totalitarian tendencies as well. But then you have millions of small companies who want to do business with Europe as well. It's a completely different uh, environment as well. Do you see opportunity for us to build some kind of soft power approach through smaller trade and uh, avoiding some of these bigger uh, issues? Jürgen shaking his head. What do you think, Nicholas? Yeah, very Me? Yeah, Nicholas first, and you're going to after. Yeah, yeah, Nicholas. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, look, uh, I am not, uh, I would say, working with this issue on everyday basis. But looking at your question, I am a bit skeptical because business is interlinked with the politics in China and everything is under control. I uh, was born in a communist country and I have very bad memory, very precise, but very bad memory. They are trying to play classical, classical uh, uh, game, divide ed impera, divide and rule. And they are linking investment with political influence. Look at Piraeus sport in Greece and some other uh, examples. But so, so why don't we do the same? This is my point, is that they're using this and it's clear we know what the game is, but we're kind of playing along with it. Why are we not using our soft power and the same way on the opposite side. Greater. Maybe, maybe there, is not, there, are, there is not so strong political supervision on our side. We are organized completely differently. Our business is absolutely independent and free. I am not a trade, a fair, uh, agreements, and We have a trade agreement coming up with China as well. Uh, our trade agreements are, are supposed to be bound by an ethical foreign, pol foreign and trade policy as well. And are our red lines just like a soft pink at the moment that nobody really cares? Or should we be beating these up and, and demanding an accountability, not just from our own companies there, but also from the, the Chinese in terms of their participation? Look, uh, we should be open. We should welcome everybody who wants to invest, but we should avoid the threat. To take US as a quidentant partner, this is not true. Hans Gary is very clear. US is our ally, not a partner. This is our ally. 
This is the first precondition. And the second, to avoid a trap to be under political influence. Uh, and we should be open. If there is a business which can be mutually beneficial, we should welcome this. But to avoid political influence, to be absolutely free when it comes to political decision making. Thank you. We have so many comments. I'm going to just be fair to those who sent them in. I'm going to read some of these out. Pay attention. If there's something to comment on, you get a moment, an opportunity in just a moment. And um, we're running close to our time. So Nora Barra says, to prevent migration, especially in crisis periods, it is the duty of the EU to develop relevant neighborhood policies with Africa. Uh, Margarita Skogovic, uh, Skogovic, she writes also, internationally, the situation looks like it was in 1989, but the EU acting without understanding that. And she says, I was rapporteur on the economic policy. No economic EU policy now anymore. Therefore, so many questions about the recovery fund uh, still apply. Digitalization and green economy is not economic policy. Let me get some pushback on that. Let's see. And uh, a definition of economic policy is growth, inflation, employment, external trade balance. Neither is good. A question I uh, sent in earlier from Shami Hak from Netherlands. If COVID-19 remains a problem, what will the EU do to prevent mass unemployment? That's a huge question. And uh, also from the public, Maria uh, Isabel Nieto Fernandez uh, from Spain. In your opinion, is a European army possible? You may ask, does it exist? This doesn't have a name yet. And uh, let me see, Julie Ward. Hi, Julie, good to see you. Uh, can the social pillar, uh, for Julie's former um, member also, can the social pillar become more prominent as we go forward as a responsibility to our poorest, most vulnerable citizens is paramount? We must leave anyone behind. Maria, Joao, let's start with you on the social pillar. Yeah, I, I like this one, in fact, because uh, we could approve the European Social Pillar last uh, legislature. And now we are turning these into uh, a key reference for all citizens, particularly when we are dealing with the COVID crisis, because uh, this is uh, putting under stress our fundamental rights to health, public health, to protect our jobs, to protect uh, healthy working conditions and uh, our social protection as a whole. So uh, I really hope that uh, the national recovery plans, which are now being prepared by all member states, they will put a lot of focus on uh, uh, ensuring that European social pillar will be uh, turning into reality in all regions of Europe. I believe this is the best safety net we, we have. Uh, and uh, if Europe is perceived as an entity who can protect uh, citizens in this difficult uh, situation we are now, uh, this is a must. So I do believe that the European Social Pillar should become a foundation for uh, the European uh, project uh, in the next week. Thank you. Just, uh, I'm going to ask just for short answers just to get through a few more of these possible. Let's go to Hans Gert on the question of the European Army. Uh, is European Army possible? Yes, of course, uh, it's possible. And if you allow me, I was chairman of the uh, subcommittee security and disarmament in the European Parliament from 1984 to 1994. So that's a long time ago. And when we started to discuss security and defense questions, people from the very left and from the very right said they are idiots, they are naive. And now we are discussing these questions, but we are not far enough. And I would like to see a European army or maybe better should say army of the European of the Europeans. That means that we have uh, multinational um, armed forces and that we coordinate our arms production. We would save a lot of money. And at the same time, we should use our uh, means for soft power. So we need strong power and we need soft power and we need a combination of both. And only if we do this, uh, other countries like China, like Russia and others, even the United States, will take us serious. I'm very much in favor of having a common foreign security and defense policy. Thank you. Former Prime Minister uh, Miklas Zorinda, um, a question on the mass unemployment. Um, I'm sure this was something you uh, thought about often. So if COVID remains a problem, will the EU prevent mass unemployment? Very briefly, we, c we have only two possibilities, I guess. The first is to promote structural reforms in our countries. 
it, uh, we should make it clear that the, the basic responsibility lies on the national states uh, following the, the subsidiarity principle. And this is why we need to also, when it comes to recovery fund spending, we should support especially innovation driven reforms and structural reforms of our economies. This is the only way how to create new jobs. And I fully agree with everybody that in the, in, in the upcoming autumn and the winter, we will listen only jobs, 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 especially for young people. I think so too. I'm going to give you just a moment to collect your thoughts. You've got 30 seconds for your final remarks. I'm just going to read out some of the other questions that we had here. Maybe you want to touch on them as well. Um, so we had Joe already read, uh, Joan uh, Valid is a former member. Uh, you know, in Spain, since October 2, 2017, there are political prisoners and politics in exile. Uh, three of them are today members of the European Parliament. The decisions of the Belgian and German justice have been in demonstration. They are not guilty. Shall the EU take this into account in the future, he says. Uh, we have Robert Moorland, uh, UK, uh, former EPP. How important do you believe the results of the US election will, in November will be to European policy? I think we touched on that. Uh, my good friend, Oz Pertile uh, in Slovenia. Uh, also former Prime Minister, uh, he asked, in large, the EU does not mean United Europe yet, but what do we, uh, we can do progress only if we share the same understanding of some basic values, uh, human dignity first, he says. Are we mature enough to start the conference on the future of Europe, he asked. Uh, the fight about money is important, but what about the soul of Europe? I think we should do a long coffee over that one. John Purvis uh, from Scotland. Uh, are the democratic and other fundamental standards of the EU important enough uh, for the future of Europe? And uh, what are these standards? And uh, another question here from uh, Maria Joao, but I think if you go to a program we did over coffee, you get your answer. How can the pr principles of enlightenment change the future of Europe? Um, she likes Kaczynski. Uh, if you want to take a, a look at some art and reference that, I think it's a good starting point. And how is civil society being included in the conference in the future of Europe? We touched on that as well. Um, 30 seconds for each of you. You may touch on those questions or your own conclusions. Let's start from the top of my screen uh, with Hans Gertz. 30 seconds, sir. We as European Union are not the paradise on earth, but we are the better part of the earth and we should defend it with all our possibilities. I love that. Thank you. Jürgen. Even if we have to face so many problems, don't forget how many people are seeking to come into this union. Thank you, said the liberal optimists. Thank you. Nicholas. <laughs> I like the emphasis on the soul of Europe. I am a man, very pragmatical one, uh, dealing with money much more, but soul is substantial. And we need not only to talk about values, but we should value also courage and political leadership. The last politician who emphasized this was Helmut Kohl, and he was very right. Thank you. Renaud, do you have a closing remark, quick comment? One, I mean, it's impressive. Uh listening to the questions to see how many problems there are that need to be tackled. Um, and uh, of course, there would be room for fear. But I think we, we should also recognize that all these problems are problems that states on their own cannot solve. So Europe is bound to succeed. Thank you. Suzanne. Well, it looks like we need dialogue. It's good that we started this dialogue between us and there should be even more about it. We have a lot of good ideas and concepts and we have values to, uh, uh, to, to stand on. And I think we should uh, work in this dimension to do it. And I just one sentence and I would even uh, have one uh, point. I think it would be have, good to have even more gender balance. And uh, how do we miss this afternoon? I should have brought this up more. Um, let's finish with Maria Joao. Well. Yes, and uh, I, I, I commend uh, Maria, Maria McGuinness, uh, my compatriot, to as commissioner in the near future as well. So we'll start with your finances in good shape and good time. Maria Joao, last word yours. Well, uh, we Europeans, we invented enlightened. Uh, I think we can invent a new one. Uh, for this, we need to have plural debate. This was a beautiful example today. And we need just to repeat this again. And thank you. Huh? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Brian. My pleasure. I was fun. Thank you very much.
Let me just thank our panelists, uh, Hans Gerf uh, Buttering, uh, Nicholas Zurinda, Maria Joao Rodriguez, Jürgen Martins, Susan Rico, and uh, also Rena Duhus. And thanks also for our team, for Elizabeth and the crew for uh, pulling all this together as well. Really uh, great job. Thank you to our former MEPs um, who've taken the time uh, to be online to send in their questions. And uh, hopefully they're motivated to, to do more of this as well. It's a good discussion today. And for those of you who participated uh, on Facebook and on Twitter today as well, I hope it was worth your while. Please uh, share some of the content. Can you uh, tag the former members association with any of your comments and they'll retweet those uh, for you as well. And make sure you get an invite next time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a lovely evening. Thanks for joining us and see you soon. <laughs>